Hello and welcome to the first meeting of 2021 of the Southwest Hearts Astronomical Society. Uh, the topic tonight is going to be astronomical instrumentation before the telescope and it'll be presented by Mike Leggett. I'm uh, just going to do a quick run through tonight's agenda. First we'll have a few notices, then a news item from Len Mann, and then we'll have the main presentation from Mike Leggett followed by a description of the upcoming night sky with Richard Westwood using his planetarium software. Just got a few notices to tell you about as well. Okay, so now we're recording, uh, just uh, so you're aware of that. And then uh, I suggest you use the speaker view, uh, which is uh, just having the one person visible up in this, the speaker part of the, of the screen. Uh, that way you can see most of the screen and you can see who's talking and you can hear who's talking. Um, during the presentation, you can use the chat if you want to raise questions or at the end of the talk, we'll try and do uh, audio questions so that people just unmute their mics and, and ask questions. I think that'll work just as well. And then I want to tell you a little bit about the next meeting. So without further ado, I'll tell you about the next meeting. Uh, our next meeting will be on February the 26th and the speaker is going to be John McLean and he's going to talk to us about uh, the OSIRIS-REx mission, which is um, a sample and return mission uh, to Bennu. And that's going to be quite interesting. Uh, John is actually the UK uh, ambassador for NASA for this particular mission, so he's well placed to tell us uh, uh, the detail of that mission. So next I'm going to uh, stop sharing and I'm going to ask Glenn to take on the news item. And uh, let's just do that. I'm going to pass control over to Len. Right. Can uh, everyone see that? And uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, that's good. OK, right. Well, this is um, uh, a little update about uh, space launches. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot happening at the moment. It's um, an exciting time for ways of getting into space. Um, the first one I want to mention is uh, Virgin Orbit. That's uh, a new launcher um, backed by uh, Richard Branson, of course. And um, it's uh, a, um, a small rocket that's designed to deliver smaller satellites uh, into orbit. It has the advantage that because it's launched from a plane, it doesn't need a spaceport. So um, it uses um, airports, obviously. And um, <clears throat> the rocket itself is strapped beneath a 747. I, th I think Richard Branson's got quite a few of those spare at the moment. So uh, that helps his uh, case. Um, and as a close up here, and you can see the launcher, which is 70 feet long, which shows you how enormous a 747 is. So that launcher is a two stage launcher. and. Uh, it has a, a small payload capacity of 300 kilograms and um, it can reach, with that payload, it can reach 500 kilometers above Earth in, into orbit. Um, and this actual one had 10 of NASA's small CubeSat satellites into it, uh, in, in it. So um, <clears throat> that's something I'm sure that will do regular visits to space and uh, is a company that he started. Um, <clears throat> It's quite separate from his other venture, Virgin Galactic. Um, and uh, that, uh, as you can see, as I'm sure most of you know, is a, a special plane, which as you can see, has got this double fuselage. Um, and that um, carries uh, this, uh, is the, the, rock, the, the plane itself is called White Knight 2, and it carries the rocket beneath it, which is called Spaceship 2. And that has, um, I think it's seven or, or eight passengers, which uh, then speed up to 100 kilometers above uh, the Earth, and they get five minutes of weightlessness and uh, experience space, all for 200,000 pounds each or so. It's a good bargain, I think, but I don't think I'll be going. <laughs> um, it, it's had a checkered history, as you know, with accidents, and uh, it keeps going to be next month but I understand it really is going to be next month that this is going to take its first passengers in, into space. Um, okay, the, the next um, uh, launch vehicle 
uh, is um, the SpaceX uh, Falcon 9, which is a very successful rocket. I'm sure you all know that goes to space uh, frequently. The one on the left here is has the Dragon capsule, um, which takes uh, human beings up to space. It's done two trips with humans so, so far, both of which have gone to the uh, International Space Station. And uh, that's its uh, main purpose. Um, and on the right, you've got another version of the Falcon 9, which, um, well, one of them carries cargo to the space station. This one is delivering satellites. And this is recent news, this particular one, because this particular rocket um, launched 143 satellites in one go, which seems pretty amazing. Um, and it is the, a new record um, of those uh, satellites. 10 of them were Starlink satellites. They're the ones that are going to low Earth orbit uh, and provide an internet service. The ones that us astronomers hate because they're going to be clouding the, the sky with reflections. But he's not the only company doing that, of course. He's just the first. And uh, the other, uh, there were 130 uh, private um, company satellites in that same uh, payload. I must look up how they actually launch them and separate them all. That's something I, I haven't uh, worked out yet. That's quite a challenge. Um, <clears throat> right, the next uh, one um, is the amazing Starship, also by SpaceX and Elon Musk. And uh, they, they, this, they're up to their ninth prototype. This is uh, a distant picture of SN9, which was supposed to launch three days ago, then two days ago, then today. And uh, apparently there's a, a row between uh, SpaceX and the FAA giving them permission. I'm sure they'll sort that out soon. But it, it is, um, it's, Elon Musk is putting all his money and is putting all his eggs in this basket of uh, this rocket to replace all his other rockets. Now it's nine meters in diameter. Now I'm in quite a big room here and on the long edge, it's six meters. So I've got to multiply that by 50% and then consider that as a circle. It's, it's like the area of a small house. It's absolutely enormous. And then it's um, 50 meters high, which, um, you know, it's uh, an incredible spacecraft. It's, it's only going through um, altitude tests up to about 10 kilometers at the moment and uh, attempting to land as it takes off. The uh, SN8 spectacularly exploded on, on landing, but um, I mean, that's what prototypes do and uh, hopefully SN9 will do a better job of it. Um, it has, uh, it's either five or six engines it's due to have, the new Raptor engine, which burns methane and oxygen. And that power is capable to lift a full payload from either the moon or Mars. It's not powerful enough to lift it from Earth. Um, so for that, uh, this is a drawing, of course, and, and there is the Starship on the top half, and on the uh, bottom half is the Super Heavy. He's, he has already made two prototypes of that. That has 30 Raptor engines in the bottom, and it's specifically designed to lift the Starship into orbit. Um, so some very impressive spacecraft. Um, and the, the, the key feature of them is they're all 100% reusable, uh, whereas all spacecraft at the moment are either thrown away at the end or they're partly reusable, like the Falcon 9. But this is 100% reusable. Both parts will land back on Earth upright, just like in all the magazines we used to lead, read when we were lads <laughs> or lasses. Um, and 100% uh, reusable. So it'll take a few years for this to get going, but if he pulls it off, it will be pretty unbelievable. Um, the last slide here is just a little bit of uh, news. One of the um, purposes of uh, the Starship um, is to get around the Earth from one point to another within an hour. You, you, apparently you can get from New York to Sydney in half an hour uh, when it's eventually in service. But of course, it's a bit of a dangerous thing to take off. So um, SpaceX, along with NASA, have purchased two X oil rigs. And um, 
they've not they've not actually published this, but the belief is that they're going to convert them to uh, launch and um, landing platforms, and then they can go off the coast of New York, off the coast of Sydney, etc. And uh, that's where the rockets will take off and land. So um, it's all sort of sci-fi stuff, which actually could become real. But um, that's uh, that's all I've got on the space uh, launch news. Here's the end of the news. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Len. And I'll try and take back the screen share. Okay. So yeah, I think I've got control back again now. So. I'm just going to move on to mention a few words about tonight's speaker. I'll, I'll not uh, dwell on this too long because Mike can talk about himself if he likes, but he's been in astronomy since 1976 and helped found the South Lincolnshire Astronomical and, and Geophysical Society. His background is chemistry and pharmacology, and actually that probably comes in quite handy these days. But uh, he's a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, a fellow of the British Interplanetary Society, founder member of the Society for History of Astronomy, a member of the BAA, the British Astronomical Society. He's also a member of the Planetary Society, which is, a, I believe it's a US uh, uh, society that's been around for a while. And um, the Society for Popular Astronomy. Uh, as you know, Robin Schedule is a, a key member there as well. Um, and also the William Herschel Society, the National Space Society, and I believe his current role is he's a member of the Milton Keynes Astronomical Society and is currently the publicity officer. I'm not quite sure if he's in chairman or of publicity role, but uh, I put down chairman as well because that was part of the thing that I saw about him. So that's a little bit about Mike and his talk tonight is that there were many instruments uh, before the uh, astronomical telescope and uh, it's going to be um, your job now to remember all of these and learn about these instruments that perhaps you didn't know about. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Mike. So I'm, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, get Mike to um, share his screen. So Mike, I've, I've made you host. If you can unmute your microphone and uh, share your screen, then we should uh, be good to go. Okay, if you just give me a moment to no problem. find the presentation. There it is. And then, uh, oh, there we go, slideshow. Okay, uh, can everyone see the slide now? The title slide, Astronomical Instrumentation Before the Telescope. Yes, we can. That's, yep. that's good. OK. I, I'm going to mute now. OK, right. Uh, well, thank you for that um, introduction, Sean. Um, uh, I have to say there's a bit of out of date information you've got in that I'm no longer publicity officer for the Milton Keynes Society, but I'm still vice chairman. So um, but that's a minor point. Just uh, just so that everybody has the correct information. Um, so here's three examples of astronomical instrumentation that goes back um, before, well before the telescope, in fact. On the left, an example of an armillary sphere. Uh, in the middle, an astrolabe. And on the right, an astronomical clock. And I'll say a little bit more about these um, as we go through this talk. Now, one thing I perhaps should say about this talk is it's not going to be a detailed talk about how these things are used, um, uh, all the um, sort of detailed background to their operation and everything. It's more putting them into their historical context, giving a little bit of overview about their uses and the principles of operation. Uh, but I'm not going to do um, uh, uh, great detail on how you would use one of these things. So let's just have a look at the outline. This is how I always like to start my talks with a, a summary of what we're going to cover. Um, 
So firstly, looking at the early instrumentation interpreted very loosely because um, one might want to debate whether or not some of the things I cover under prehistoric astronomy uh, is um, what you'd call instrumentation, but it's there all the same. And then um, I look at ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. A substantial part of the talk looks at ancient Greece. Uh, and um, that includes um, Hellenistic Egypt, uh, the great library at Alexandria and all that, and Ptolemy. Um, but um, this is where, of course, um, the gnomons, sundials, the astrolabe, the armillary sphere, some of Ptolemy's astronomical instrumentation and the quadrant come in. Um, then a section on medieval and Renaissance instrumentation, uh, looking at um, uh, the um, Islamic Middle East, uh, Isla Islamic and Christian Spain, uh, medieval France, medieval England, little bit about mechanical clocks uh, and then finally um, the instrumentation uh, and work of the last great pre-telescopic uh, astronomer who also in many ways marks the beginning of modern practical astronomy uh, minus the telescopes and that's Tycho Brahe. And then finally, a concluding section. So that's the outline. So um, first of all, looking at possible prehistoric um, uh, astronomical artifacts, there are a number of artifacts of potential astronomical significance. The oldest are some bone artifacts which have um, notches of about um, uh, 27 to 31 uh, moon-shaped marks cut into the bone. Uh, and it's suggested that this might be possible counting of lunar days, which would give an indication of um, lunar months. From about uh, 4,500 to uh, 4,000 BC uh, began to be the long barrows uh, constructed. And these were elongated burial mounds, which uh, may have been aligned on the rising or setting of bright stars. Uh, one of the advantages of these, of course, from an observational viewpoint, was they provided an artificial horizon. Using a distant horizon can sometimes be quite difficult, quite problematic. But uh, uh, an artificial horizon closer to uh, can be uh, a lot easier for observational purposes. From about... Um, 3500 BC, there's the round barrows. And then uh, from about 3000 BC, uh, the circular structures um, appear, uh, of which Stonehenge is probably the best known. Uh, there's a uh, photograph there of Stonehenge. Um, and particular significance. Uh, though not necessarily the only factor of interest related to Stonehenge, was the solstices, um, especially the midwinter solstice. Uh, I know the Druids, or so-called modern Druids, like to gather there for the midsummer uh, solstice, but actually, uh, historically, the view is that the midwinter solstice was of far greater importance and one can understand why it would be more significant as well because obviously they would want to know that the days 
uh, uh, were once again lengthening that they'd reached the point of the year when they would expect uh, the hours of daylight to begin to grow. So the, the mid-winter solstice was quite significant. Um, objects of potential interest including uh, included um, the stars Deneb, Rigel and Aldebaran, which respectively are the brightest stars in their constellations. Uh, the sun, the solstices I've already mentioned in the context of um, uh, the um, uh, of Stonehenge, both midwinter and midsummer. Uh, observations of the moon, uh, including um, also fluctuations, the major and minor standstills, uh, in the Bronze Age around about um, 2000 BC. And John North, in his book, uh, The Fontana History of Astronomy and Cosmology, has noted that many of the sites were in use for the best part of a millennia. Uh, so um, it is not impossible that uh, observations by successive generations over a uh, period of time would have led to an awareness of the gradual drifting of stars uh, 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 and um, changes in the um, uh, the night sky. Uh, in fact, one of the things uh, in related to this is changes of the pole star, which is to do with uh, precession. And I'll mention a little bit more about that in the context of ancient Egypt, uh, which is where we come to actually. So on the right, you've got a map of ancient Egypt showing um, some of the significant um, places uh, in uh, Upper Egypt. Um, as I remarked when I did the outline, the golden age of uh, Egyptian astronomy was Hellenistic. That's really later on after the time of Alexander the Great. But um, nevertheless, there was interest in astronomy in a variety of ways reflected um, during ancient Egypt. Uh, the significant uh, aspects for tonight's talk relates principally to the astronomical alignment of buildings and the measurement of time. So first of all, there was Imhotep, um, who was the architect of the steppe pyramid of um, King Zosa at uh, I think this one was at, um, if I remember correctly, that was at uh, Saqqara. Yeah, that's, that's at Saqqara. And you've got north and south Saqqara marked here in the map on the right that shows the main pyramid sites in Egypt. Um, the uh, Imhotep is described, by the way, as being a physician, magician, and astronomer. So he, uh, he had his work cut out, um, but he was also the architect of this step pyramid. The astronomical alignment of later pyramids uh, is much more accurate. They're more accurately sun orientated and they're remarkable feats of engineering in the, the leveling of the base of the pyramids um, is only sort of a few centimeters um, sort of corner to corner. So taken you know, diagonally. There are so-called ventilation shafts, which are upward slanting shafts, which were possibly directed at selected stars at upper culminations. For example, Thuban or Alpha Draconis. 
5,000 years ago, this would have been the pole star. And this is where my uh, reference to precession comes in. So this actually shows um, part of Draco, Ursa Minor at the top and uh, Ursa Major or part of Ursa Major uh, lower down. And uh, this is Thuban Alpha Draconis here. And at the time of ancient Egypt, this was the pole star. About 12,000 years ago, Vega was the pole star. Now the pole star is Polaris. But then in ancient Egypt, it was uh, Thuban. Measurement of time was done in a number of ways. Um, shadow clocks were used with four or five divisions on the base, uh, as shown in the two sketches here. And there were two positions, depending on whether it was morning or afternoon. There were also water clocks, which was um, based really on uh, uh, time against the flow of water. Um, I suppose a, a bit like how uh, hourglass egg timer type things, only uh, using water instead of, of sand. The earliest example was Amenhotep III, or during the reign of Amenhotep III, uh, 1397 to 1360 BC. But this was rec related to earlier calendar reckoning of Amenhotep I. Uh, who ranged from 1545 to 1525 uh, BC. Measurement of time was also dependent on the use of star clocks. And stars were observed as they crossed um, the meridian. Uh, and this actually uh, was done sometimes uh, using the reference point of the head uh, and um, ears and shoulders of a seated man. And the stars were observed as they crossed the meridian. And water clocks again may have been used to draw up star clocks. From about the 6th century BC, they began to use Egyptian slip palm leaves with a plumb line. And the transit of a star was timed as it crossed the plumb line observed through the slit in the palm leaf. So that was probably a little bit more accurate way of doing it. Now, moving on to Mesopotamia, um, just a little bit of geographical introduction. Um, it's the area between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, sometimes called the cradle of civilization, because that was a particularly um, fertile area. And it was uh, also an area where the first, or it's thought the first cities were established. Modern Iraq covers much of Mesopotamia. Uh, but in the ancient world, there were two main political divisions, and that was Sumeria and Babylonia in the south and Assyria in the north. And on the map shown in black are the ancient cities. So you've got Ur, Babylon and Nineveh uh, and the modern cities just as reference points are shown in red. So there's Damascus, Baghdad, and Kuwait. One of the most significant things uh, that um, came out of Mesopotamia uh, is the um, Venus tablet uh, from the time of the reign of King Amazaduga. The Venus tablet was found by Sir Henry Layard, and it's now in the British Museum. And it lists the helical risings of Venus for 21 years, gives the years, months, and day numbers on which Venus was first seen and last seen as a morning and evening star. 
this diagram here um, explains, though using modern um, approach to planetary motions, so it's a heliocentric view. It's not the view, obviously, that they had um, in uh, the uh, ancient world in Mesopotamia, but it's what we now know to be the case for the solar system. This actually presents diagrammatically what the Venus tablet shows. So you have the orbit of the Earth along the outside here. I don't know, can you see the E, which um, uh, is behind the, the gallery at the moment on my yeah. screen? Can you that see the E? Yeah. OK. Um, and that's the orbit of the Earth. E means Earth. Then you've got the orbit of the Venus here, Sun at the center. And um, the conjunctions, superior conjunction and inferior conjunction here. And when Venus is in between these two lines here, it is invisible. So this portion is invisible. Here, it's morning star, and here it appears as an evening star. MS and ES are stationary points. That are, those are points where Venus appears to have no, no motion. And MS is the morning stationary point, and ES is the evening stationary point. It's first seen as a morning star at point MF and first seen as an evening star at point EF. It's last seen as a morning star at point ML and last seen as an evening star at point EL. And this is actually what the Venus tablet shows on um, uh, what's shown on the Venus tablet. From about um, 1000 to 612 BC, Mesopotamia was under Assyrian domination. And um, measurement of time was based on two methods, really. Seasonal hours, which involved division of day and night into 12 equal parts. Uh, and the Greek historian Herodotus suggests that this was the origin of the 12 part day in Greece. And also the method of equal hours as measured by daily rotation of the heavens uh, using star clocks and the like, and also the water clock. The conversion between the two was viewed as an astronomical problem. Uh, and um, astronomers used a system of 12 double hours, which were each divided into 30 parts. Also from Mesopotamia were the Mul Apin tablets, which included a lot of information on them, um, not necessarily all of it specifically related to um, instrumentation and observations, but there were constellation patterns recorded. Uh, there were a list of secondary stars that crossed the meridian or culminated as fundamental stars were rising. Using a gnomon, which I will say more about later on, uh, there were records of times and lengths of a shadow, and also rules for calculating the rising and setting of the moon. So now we move on to ancient Greece and Rome, although there's not really a huge amount said about Rome in, in this talk, but it does sort of fit in together. A brief bit about the historical background. Then looking at sundials and the gnomon, the armillary sphere, the astrolabe, 
and uh, Ptolemy and astronomical instrumentation, and then finally the quadrant. Uh, and just looking at the historical background, um, there's what we call classical Greece, uh, which is really um, Greece prior to the time of Alexander the Great. Uh, then the Hellenistic world and Alexandria, uh, which really is uh, after the conquests of Alexandria, the, Alexander the Great uh, and the establishment of his rather short-lived empire. And then finally, um, the Roman Empire. Um, so first of all, the gnomon is a basically it's a mounted uh, a rod or plate mounted vertically or often at an angle to form a shadow stick. Uh, and in fact, here's an example of uh, the gnomon. Uh, and this actually is on a sundial in Spalding in Lincolnshire. Uh, the astronomical uses included solstice measurements, measurement of the size of the size of the Earth, and timekeeping, as shown on the right, used on sundials, and the direction of the shadow indicates the apparent solar time. Uh, and the measure of time is based on the actual daily motion of the real sun. Uh, and the altitude of the sun is calculated from the height of rod and length of shadow. Here's another example of a gnomon. This one's from the solar clock, uh, Shenley Lodge in Milton Keynes. Uh, and um, Anaximander of Miletus um, performed one of the earliest known experiments involving observations on a moving shadow cast by a vertical stick uh, from which he was able to deduce the, deduce the length of the year and seasons. He was apparently the first person in Greece to make a sundial and he prepared a map of the known world and a celestial globe showing the patterns of the constellations. Aristarchus of Samos um, also made a sundial uh, called the Scaife, um, which was uh, a type of sundial that consisted of a hemispherical bowl with a pointer or gnomon which cast shadow on a network of hour lines. Um, he also argued that the Earth and the planets orbit the sun, uh, one of the pioneers of the heliocentric view, and he is author of On the Sizes and Distances of the Sun and the Moon, and that, that book still survives. Um, and um, he was the first to attempt the distance of the moon uh, uh, using the method of the curvature of the Earth's shadow during lunar eclipse. And he was the first to attempt the, to determine the distance of the sun. The principle of the method was sound, but it was difficult to make accurate measurements. Uh, and this is uh, Sir Thomas Heath's book, Aristarchus of Samos, the Ancient Copernicus, which is published by Dover. Well worth uh, getting hold of uh, if you haven't already got it. So this is what uh, Aristarchus's method was, in essence. Um, if the moon shines by reflected sunlight, so here's the moon, then at exactly half moon, the Earth moon sun angle must be 90 degrees, as shown here. The measurement of the angle at the Earth was 87 degrees. Therefore, the angle at the sun, given that um, the 
angles of a triangle should all add up to a, uh, 180 degrees, this would be three degrees. This gave an Earth-Sun distance of 18 to 20 times greater than the Earth-Moon distance. Um, moving on now to Alexandria, um, I think it's perhaps fair to say that um, uh, the principle of uh, Aristarchus's attempts to make uh, distance determinations was sound, but um, in practical terms, it was quite challenging to make an accurate measurement. It might have been possible if the surface of the moon was completely smooth, but with a very uneven surface, it was very, very challenging. So that made it um, more uh, difficult. So now moving on to uh, Hellenistic world and um, uh, Alexandria. Alexander III, the Great, um, uh, from about 356 to 323 BC, um, undertook a, a sort of military campaign throughout um, the Eastern Mediterranean. And one of the things he tended to do was found new cities named after himself. One of these was the city of Alexandria in northern Egypt, uh, which was founded in 332 by Alexander the Great and which became famous for its libraries and museum. Aristilus was the first to record relative positions of stars, uh, but Timocorus built on this, making accurate measurements of star positions. And Spica was used by Hipparchus 150 years later to demonstrate the precession of the equinoxes. Eratosthenes of Cyrene was a librarian at Alexandria um, who uh, made an accurate measurement of the circumference of the Earth. And this is how he did it. Um, the parallel sun's rays um, would be directly overhead at noon on the 21st of June at Syene here. Um, now, angle A at Alexandria could be measured at the same time, and this would give a shadow length, as shown here. Um, from simple geometry, angle A there uh, is equal to angle B here at the centre of the Earth. Now, he knew the distance between Syene and Alexandria because he'd had somebody pace it out. So that had been measured. Uh, and it was seven degrees apart on the circumference of the Earth. So on that basis, he was able to determine the Earth's circumference. The astrolabe was invented by Greek astronomers and it's probable that it was actually Hipparchus who uh, invented it. Over 40 uses are described in treatises, uh, including for astronomical observations, telling the time based on position of the sun and bright stars, the uh, computation of the position of sun and bright stars at any time or date, also used in navigation and surveying and as a teaching device. Uh, and um, the disadvantages were that it was restricted to the latitude for which it was designed. It was too small for accurate computation. It only gave approximations. And it was no great value for precise observations. 
but as a teaching device, it had few equals in clarifying problems in positional astronomy. So Hipparchus of Nicaea um, was the probable inventor of the astrolabe. Um, he determined the distance of the moon using the method of Aristarchus and the Earth diameter of Eratosthenes to give an Earth moon distance of 240,000 miles. He classified stars according to brightness with the brightest first magnitude and the dimmest sixth mag magnitude. And he's been considered by many to be the father of ast astrometry. He recorded the position over 800 stars uh, and made the first important star map. And he discovered the precession of the equinoxes uh, and also constructed trigonometric tables. This is um, an illustration, a photograph of um, a replica of a typical medieval astrolabe. Um, showing the front and the back with the sighting arms uh, and um, other features, which are explained in a little bit more detail in the next two slides. So firstly, the principle. S1 and S2, here's S1, here's S2, um, shows uh, two positions of the sun. S1 is shortly after sunrise, and S2 is two to three hours later. Um, N is the North Pole at the center. E1 and E2 are corresponding positions of the ecliptic, the path of the sun over a year. So here's E1 and here's E2. Um, a is an angle, here's the angle here, the horizon here and the meridian here are both stationary and the position of the arc representing the horizon depends on the latitude for which the astrolabe was constructed. So this is a rather rough sketch of the components of an astrolabe. So this is the REIT, as it's called, which shows star pointers here. This smaller circle here is the ecliptic. There's the Tropic of Capricorn here. Uh, and it was held together with the other components with the pin and the wedge or horse, sometimes called a horse because of its appearance. There was the face here with the ring, shackle and throne and the limb and the dorsum or back and the pole at the center uh, and the tin pan or plate, which the reach would sit over. There's a rule and an alley dart, which in fact were the um, uh, the well, the, the alley dart is the sighting arm, uh, and a rule was used similarly uh, as a pointer. So those were the main components. Um, now, the armillary sphere dates from at least the third century BC. It was used for astronomical observations and demonstrations. It was a type of celestial globe representing sphere of the sky with the Earth at the center. Um, but its disadvantages were that it was um, uh, difficult to make mechanically perfect, and it can be discounted as a precision instrument. The structure of the armillary sphere 
uh, is that it's um, a sphere of the sky represented by a skeletal framework of intersecting circles. Rings of the framework may be movable, uh, um, giving appearance of the sky at different times and latitudes. Uh, and um, also has smaller pointers uh, showing the fixed position of brighter stars. Uh, the rings represent important circles on the celestial sphere. Uh, there's the, the celestial equator, which is the great circle on the celestial sphere, and the, marks the boundary between the northern and southern hemispheres, and the ecliptic, which is the mean plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. One of the greatest astronomers of the ancient world was, of course, Ptolemy. His great collection, the Megalis in Taxis or Almagest, uh, is a major work. Um, the original was lost, but an Arabic translation survived. He produced a star catalogue based on that of Hipparchus, with positions of over a thousand stars recorded. He um, refined the geocentric system of Eudoxus, Aristotle and others, so much so that it became known as the Ptolemaic theory. Uh, and um, in fact, on the right there, you've got a, an image of the astronomical clock in Exeter Cathedral showing the, um, a simplified Ptolemaic system the Earth at the center, the Moon there, and the fleur de lis uh, is the Sun there. He undertook a lot of observations and uh, produced a lot of instruments as well. Uh, there was an armillary astrolaben, which was a type of armillary sphere, but had some features in common with an astrolabe, an instrument for determining the obliquity of the ecliptic, which is the angle between the planes of the Earth's equator and ecliptic, and just a reminder, the ecliptic, the mean plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. The present value is 23 degrees and 26 minutes but uh, it varies between two extreme values due to the effects of precession and mutation. There was also an apparatus for observing small angles, include, such as the apparent width of the sun's disk. Ptolemy may have been the inventor of the triquetrum, which is often known as the Ptolemy's rules. It was used for measuring the altitude of a celestial body and consisted of a vertical bar with hinged rods attached at top and bottom that are linked and an upper arm that can slide along the lower one. It was fitted with sights and the lower arm was graduated. When the object under observation is in view along the sights the position of the upper arm against the lower arm gives measure of altitude. The principle of Ptolemy's rules is that D is at the center of the circle and distance uh, DF, so here, and DE, forms the radius of the circle and EX forms a chord of the circle. Now, when um, DF and DE are open to cross the chord at uh, FE, an equilateral, an equilateral triangle with six degree internal angles is produced. Uh, if D to F cuts along the long rod, EX, at any other place, 
the resulting angle subtended at D is easily calculated from the digit read off at EX in relation to the length of the other rods. So here's the graduated scale along EX. Finally, from um, this section is the quadrant. The origin of the quadrant is uncertain. The only thing that can be said about it is that it is um, a very ancient instrument. Um, it was used for measurements of altitudes of stars and angular separation of celestial objects. There were small portable handheld quadrants and large mural quad quadrants, uh, of which one of the best known and most spectacular was that of Tycho Brahe. Um, the modern equivalent is actually the transit circle or meridian circle. So it's still around, albeit in a different form. And the sighting pegs here were used to locate the star and the string and plumb line here was used to read the angle from the scale shown there. Okay, now um, looking now at um, the Renaissance and medieval um, periods. Um, in uh, the Islamic world, there were things called zij, which essentially were astronomical tables. Uh, and, um, but often they included um, uh, information that would be required for use of astronomical instruments, such as the astrolabe, uh, but also often material on instruments. So al khwarizmi included a treatise on the astrolabe uh, and al uh included information on instruments also. Um, al Hazen uh, did a treatise on optics, which was the first important book on optics since Ptolemy. In terms of observatories in Eastern Islam, um, Almanon built a major observatory in 829 with instruments made in Damascus, one of the major instrument making centers, including a, mur a marble mural quadrant and an iron gnomon. Ibn Yunus um, established an observatory with large instruments including an armillary and an astrolabe. And observations were made on obliquity, eclipses, and atmospheric refraction of the solar ray at the horizon. Uh, al Kajandi emphasized in his zij the importance of observation. And there was a colossal meridian sextant of 80 cubits and solar observations to mark the sun's distance from the zenith. Um, Nazir al-Din al-Tusi began the construction at uh, Maraga of a, um, an observatory with the large mural quadrant parallactic rules about which I've not really said very much or anything at all really. Um, armillary and quadrants adjustable in azimuth. And Ulu Bay uh, established an observatory at Samarkand uh, around 1420 to 1421. And the chief instrument was an enormous stone sextant. Al Kashi was a member of staff at the observatory and designed a new type of equatorium as an alternative to the zij. Now, an equatorium has some things in common with an astrolabe, but whereas an astrolabe is principally about 
position of stars. Uh, equatoria were used for planetary positions. Uh, it was quicker, but less accurate. Um, but Hula Bay's big um, downfall, of course, was he believed in astrology. And uh, horoscope foretold that his son would kill him. So he banished his son, who promptly raised an army, invaded uh, Ulu Bay's um, uh, kingdom, and having defeated Ulu Bay, put him to death. So um, the prophecy had a strange way of fulfilling itself. Um, then finally, Istanbul, uh, the last of the observatories I sort of cover in this section, uh, had large scale instruments, but it's questionable how useful they actually were. Instruments of research in Eastern Islam were relatively rare. Armillaries, as noted already, were difficult to make mechanically perfect because of the, the circular structure of the components uh, or spherical construction, really, uh, overall. They weren't precision instruments. Planospheric astrolabes uh, were more commonly used. Again, celestial globes were difficult because it was uh, difficult to cast spheres. But typical celestial globe would have the main astronomical circles and perhaps 20 or 30 of the brightest stars. But the richest would have a substantial fraction of, 10, of, of 1,022 stars and representation of constellations. Important centers for instrument manufacture was Damascus and Haran. Now, moving on to um, uh, Spain, 900 AD, this area of southern Spain and Portugal was under Islamic control and it was the Caliphate of Cordoba. So we have Cordoba. But the most significant center for much of astronomical activity in Spain over the centuries was Toledo. Um, so Al Majriti made the adaptation of the tables of Al Khwarizmi to the meridian of Cordoba. Uh, Ibn al Sam uh, of Granada, Abul Qasim as he's also known, wrote treatises on the astrolabe and the equatorium. Uh, and Aben Mot also compiled Zij, which was translated into Latin by Gerard of Cremona in Toledo uh, in the 12th century. In the late 11th century, a group of astronomers formed a school in Toledo. Uh, this included Azar Kel, uh, who made instruments and water clocks for the Khwadi of Toledo uh, and wrote um, original treatises on equatorium and the universal astrolabe, a form known as the Sophia. By 1100 AD, um, the a view of Spain had changed considerably. Uh, the Caliphate of Cordoba occupied a much smaller area, and Toledo was now in the Christian kingdom of Leon and Castile. Toledo was reconquered in 1085. Um, Portugal only occupied this small area here, area here. Uh, hadn't got as far as Lisbon, which is the capital of modern Portugal. Uh, and Navarre here with Pamplona, the sort of Basque country really, then you had Aragon and the county of Barcelona. Alfonso X, King of Castile, known as Alfonso the Wise, and this is a statue of him outside the National Library in Madrid, assembled many leading astronomers at Toledo and drew up the Alphonsine tables, which remained standard for three centuries. 
Um, in medieval France, um, there was Roger Bacon, uh, who undertook experiments in optics, and William of St. Cloud, who uh, did a projection of the sun's uh, image through a pinhole aperture, what we would know as a pinhole camera. And he also compiled an accurate almanac. Also in medieval France was Peter Nightingale, uh, who invented and improved instruments for calculation, including development of a simple equatorium uh, and other devices for calculating eclipses. Uh, John of Lingnier, who wrote treatises on the Sophia, uh, the equatorium, and the directorium, which was a calculating instrument related to the astrolabe. And then Levi Ben Gerson invented the cross staff, uh, otherwise known as Jacob's staff. The uh, cross staff principle is shown in the diagram here. So you have uh, AB, a graduated rod, uh, and CD is a movable cross piece. And CD is held vertical by keeping in line with the suspended plumb. So there's the suspended plumb. To measure an altitude, e.g. the sun, move the cross piece until BC here, is in line with the sun and BD is in line with the horizon. The angle to alpha um, is the altitude. And this is given by the graduations on rod AB there. In medieval England, there was Adelard Bath, uh, who traveled widely. Uh, he studied in Tor and Laon. Uh, traveled to Greece and Syria, uh, wrote a treatise on the use of the astrolabe, as well as many other things, but most of the other things weren't astronomical. He introduced astronomic tables, Hindu Arabic numerals, and the use of zero uh, in England. Uh, and Walka, uh, prior of Great Malvern, uh, also wrote treatises on the astrolabe and eclipse calculation. Robert Gross Tet, uh, Bob Bighead as apparently he's known, um, was Bishop of Lincoln from 1235. Uh, he was active in geometry, astronomy and optics and was author of many scientific and philosophical works. And this included an astronomy handbook and a, uh, uh, a small work, De Lusa, which anticipated the Big Bang theory. Uh, and if you think that's perhaps stretching it a bit, there's a fascinating article about that in um, the BBC Sky at Night magazine by Paul Coburn in 2013. Uh, and I attended a really good lecture on the subject as well uh, some years ago. Uh, there's been a lot of work on it. I think it was at the University of Durham on, on this particular aspect. A minor planet 36169 is named after uh, Robert Gross Tet. The tomb of Robert Gross Tet is in the chapel of St. Peter and St. Paul. Uh, the so-called Students Chapel in Lincoln Cathedral, and here's Lincoln Cathedral on the right. Uh, also medieval England, Richard of Wallingford wrote a treatise on the Albion, uh, which was a type of planetary equatorium, which remained in use until the 16th century. Uh, it was not only uh, possible to use it for 
uh, planetary uh, calculations, but apparently it could also be used for much more besides. It was a, a rather more advanced um, uh, instrument. He designed a clock for St Albans Monastery, which is the oldest surviving description of any mechanical clock. Unfortunately, of course, the clock no longer survives, but it is mechanically the most sophisticated uh, of the Middle Ages. And I think there's a recreation of it in the Science Museum, if I remember correctly. Uh, then Simon Breedham was associated with the Merton calculators in Oxford uh, and was a possible constructor of an instrument combining an astrolabe and an equatorium. And Geoffrey Chaucer of Canterbury Tales fame also wrote treatises certainly on the astrolabe and possibly also on the equatorium. Many churches have sundials and what are known as scratch dials. Here are some examples, photos taken by Mark Hearn of Hell Church in Lincolnshire. Uh, you've got a sundial here and scratch dials here and here, and there's Hell Church. Uh, another example, or two examples in fact, are from Shenley Church End uh, in Milton Keynes. Um, this is St Mary's Church here. There's um, a scratch dial. And when I took this photo, not only had the sun obligingly come out, but somebody had obligingly put a stick in there as an improvised gnomon. So it helped cast a shadow. There's also this as well, which might be a scratch dial. Salisbury Cathedral clock is, of course, uh, a very old example of a uh, clock. And other early clocks include the astronomical clock in Prague and the astronomical clock at Hampton Court. So finally, we come to Tycho Brahe. Um, the last and possibly the greatest pre-telescopic astronomer, and in many ways, the first of the modern observational astronomers. He kind of marks the transition period between the two. Um, he made observations of a supernova in Cassiopeia, uh, 1572 to 1573, when he was in Denmark. In 1575, he visited uh, William IV, the Landgraver of Hesse in Cassel, an astronomer with the fine collection of instruments. Um, from 1575 to 1596, uh, after King Frederick II of Denmark offered in the island of Venn, he established famous observatories there from February 1576. He left Venn after a quarrel with the new king, Christian IV, uh, and for three years he was in Hamburg. Uh, and while in Hamburg, Mechanica was published which was a description of the instruments. From 1599 to 1601, he was court mathematician to Rudolf II at Prague. He set up instruments in the castle of Binatki in Prague, and he was joined by his assistant, Johannes Kepler, who completed the Rudolphine tables. The uh, establishment of the observatory at um, then was the finest observatory to date uh, at that time at the time of its establishment it operated as a research institution and it had state-of-the-art instrumentation Uraniburg 
castle of the heavens had a full complement of instruments. The buildings were carefully planned. They were plumbed for water and equipped with kitchens, library, laboratory, and eight rooms for assistance. There are even ancillary facilities, a windmill, printing office, farms, and fish ponds. Then Jernborg, Castle of the Stars, was the second observatory built in 1584. Additional instruments on secure foundations in subterranean rooms were uh, built, uh, and the ceiling, depict, ceiling depicted um, Tycho's astronomical system and six Greek astronomers of the past. This is a list of some of the astronomical instrumentation at Venn. Uh, Ptolemies, rulers, armillaries, sextants, octants, azimuthal quadrants, wood and brass, celestial globes, one of which was 1.5 meters across, and the great mural quadrant uh, and, the, uh, and the plane of the meridian and with a radius of 1.8 meters. Using the mural quadrant required three observers. And there was observation of the object through pinnels on a sighting roll, as shown in the smaller diagram that I showed earlier on, um, with the handheld quadrant. Results were entered in a ledger, and time was noted by reference to two clocks beating seconds. Of course, in this at this time, clocks were unreliable, but they were checked repeatedly against the heavens. And Tycho actually introduced checks for instrumental error and cross-checking by comparison of different instruments. Here are a few um, images of uh, some sundials, old and new, though, um, in most terms, I suppose you would say that these are all relatively new. So there's uh, one in Salisbury, St. Peter Port, Guernsey, Zagreb, Croatia, and the Dolphin Sundial at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich. So what became of the pre-telescopic instruments? Well, a lot of them are still around. In fact, a lot of them we're still using. Uh, sundials and armillary spheres are still produced, though they're often as much as anything for decorative purposes now, but they're still around. Mechanical clocks were the forerunners of our modern clocks and also the regulators and chronometers, which are used in astronomy and navigation. And the astrolabe is, of course, the forerunner of the planisphere. Um, so here we are. The, if you can see that on the screen, try not to get it reflecting too much. Uh, I mean, this is essentially the same principle as you got with the um, the planispheric astrolabe. It's just with the planisphere, it's much um, simplified. So pre-telescopic astronomical instrumentation was principally used for timekeeping, for positional astronomy, astrometry, uh, and for education and demonstrations. Technology was significant in future developments, including the telescope, uh, including grinding of lenses and invention of spectacles. Not said a huge amount of that, though I have mentioned that several people were looking at optics, no pun intended. Uh, there was the invention of the mechanical clock and also something of significance for the spread of astronomical knowledge was the development of the movable type printing press which occurred in the late Middle Ages uh, and sort of on into the Renaissance also. 
Many pre-telescopic instruments are still in use today, such as planar spheres and transit circles. Uh, here's a list of acknowledgements um, uh, of organizations have helped provide information uh, or that I've uh, used for photographs. Uh, and um, I'm grateful uh, to them. I think that's probably the end of the talk. Oh, there are a couple of references and bibliography slides here. But what I will do, um, I will probably send a longer list of references and bibliography anyway by email after this talk. Um, so I think that's the last slide. Yes, it is. So I will stop share. Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much for that. Very, very interesting indeed. Um, it always amazes me um, the ingenuity that, that uh, people come up with in, in times that we consider to be sort of dark ages. The, the thinking that went behind uh, producing these instruments was great. Now, just we'll maybe take a few minutes to ask anybody if they've got any questions they would like to, to raise. If anybody can unmute and ask a question, please do now. Doesn't look like there's anybody wants to ask any further questions. I'll just have one quick check through them, see if any hands up. No, no, nobody, nobody wants to do that. Okay, so that's fine. So on that point, this that case, we'll move on to the next section, which is. Um, Richard is going to uh, give us uh, an outline of what's visible in the night sky. Uh, but before we do that, I'd just like to thank Mike. And if you could all show your appreciation in the usual way, even though you can't be heard. Thank you very much. You need to be in gallery view to see that, Mike. But there you go. Uh, OK, good. Thank you. Uh, thanks again for that. And we'll move on to Richard now in the planetarium. So what I will do is I will uh, give host control to Richard. He decided not to not to want to do this earlier, so uh, we're having to be a bit more um, inventive. It takes a few moments to load. By the way, I would like to say thank you to Mike because one of the things that um, I belong to the um, the Society for the History of Astronomy, and it's excellent, and I've learned a huge amount on all sorts of things for going to their their um, annual general meeting, etc. So it's worthwhile, very much worthwhile. If you're interested in astronomy, it's a good thing to do. Okay, so just gonna make one or two slight alterations. Okay, that should do it. So we are now in the, um, the winter sky as we see it at the moment. Now, one of the things that, um, that I was gonna say was uh, how many people have actually, were actually able, able to observe um, over the last uh, month or so? Because I have to say that um, since, since Christmas, when I observed on Christmas Eve, um, there were only two dates that I was actually able to observe at all. And that was, that was last weekend. So it's not been a particularly good um, set a good time for astronomy over the last over January. Let's hope February is better. Now we see the sky as it is at the moment. This is this is as it is at the moment right now, and you can see that um, we've got our usual Orion in the centre there. And one of the things I pointed out in the news in the newsletter was that there is a constellation in between um, Orion and and uh, the sort of eastern sky. And it's marked, the best way to find this constellation, which is called Monoceros. It, um, it, it's, although it's an ancient constellation, it's pretty dim because it's a unicorn. And after all, unicorns are supposed to be invisible, so that's probably why. But if you use these three stars here, that's Betelgeuse, really bright and obvious, Sirius down here, and Procyon, which is up here, you come to an area, a mysterious area in the middle where there's absolutely nothing. So I'm gonna, Try and enlarge this up so we actually get some get some stars in here. 
OK, so that's a bit better. We've got a bit, few more stars. So if you use Orion's Belt, Orion's Belt is absolutely brilliant. It's one of the best, best um, ways of navigating the sky there is. If you go up, you go to Aldebar and, and Taurus. If you come down, you end up at Sirius. Um, what more could you ask? But if you use it a bit more, a bit, with a bit of uh, ingenuity, you come to a star here. This one here is actually a beta monothoritis, if that's the correct pronunciation. Um, now that is a triple star. There are not a huge number of triple stars in the sky that are easy to observe, but this one is, and it was discovered by Sir William Herschel, or William Herschel as he then was, in the same year that he discovered Uranus, 1781. Um, it's, a quite a, it's quite a very attractive double star, but it was one of his favorites. And he made the point that he'd never seen anything like it. And to be honest, to, uh, he's got a point because it really isn't that, um, that common to see three bright stars. Um, with a small telescope, you can easily resolve them. In fact, um, <laughs> last, last Sunday, I actually did that myself. Um, I hadn't seen it for a long time, but I thought it was worth a better opportunity to have a look and see if I could see it. And I found it very easily. And there it was. They're all the same. They're all white, bright stars. And uh, it does make quite a, quite a sight, really. It's, it's rather unusual compared to the normal double star. Also, if you come up here and use Betelgeuse and work outwards, you come to another star here, which is actually Epsilon or Epsilon um, Monoceritis or whatever. And that is also a double star, a very easy to see in a small telescope. Um, it actually has a blue um, main star and the, the companion is yellow. So uh, they're quite an attractive color contrast. So that's on the surface of Monothorus, which as I say is in this sort of area here. But there are other things and I'm not gonna point them out too much because if you've got a star atlas, you can certainly do this yourself and probably better. There, for instance, in here, in this area here, there's the Christmas tree cluster. It's actually a kind of triangular shape of stars that do look a little bit like Christmas tree lights. Um, they're quite bright, the component stars. And um, there's one or two different, slightly different colored stars. And the point is that, that they're ideal for looking in an astronomical telescope, because as you know, astronomical telescopes turn everything upside down. And it, as you turn it upside down, it actually becomes the right way up for being a Christmas tree. So that's one of, one of the objects you can find in that area. Very easy, very easy. That's pretty easy to find. Another one is Hubble's variable, variable nebula, which is in this similar area. And there's also star clusters here, NGC star clusters. The problem is that they're mostly, they're mostly fairly dim stars and they, they show up better in larger telescopes. Now, because this particular year, we really have no planets to look at. I, I know people would say to me, oh yes, there's Mars. Well, there is. I mean, Mars is, is still in Pisces. Pisces is still around. It will be for a little while longer. But the size of Mars's disk is now down to seven seconds of arc, which is pretty small. So if you're thinking of observing Mars and having a look at it, um, you'd need a really high power and you really want a large telescope and really most, most amateur astronomers would say that really the season of looking at Mars is now past. Unfortunately, we also have this situation with, with, with um, Saturn and Jupiter. They are in the same situation. You can't actually observe them because they're, um, they're too close to the sun. And also that's the same Mercury and Venus as well, because Venus is now heading, it's had a morning apparition, which is nearly finished. So really there aren't any planets. Now for the next few nights, we won't have a moon either because at the moment the moon, despite the fact that on my thing here, it shows a blobby kind of thing looks full, it's actually, actually, actually um, will be new on the 11th of, Feb of February and um, a few days before, it's obviously going to be last quarter. So that means that we've got a pretty long period when there aren't any um, uh, 
anything others to look at, other than anything else to look at but stars. But that does give us the chance to look at some clusters. Now I'm going to reduce the size a little bit here so that we get a few more, few more objects in, a few more, bit more sky. Now there's one thing that you can do, which I'd recommend. Um, try comparing one star cluster with another. Now that's something that we can do because at the moment we've got quite a lot of clusters on, on view. Uh, for example, you can actually make a wide swing round because up here you've got three clusters in this area here between the horns of, of uh, Taurus and Capella. Capella is this rather sort of salt, salt shaker shape. He's, he's actually supposed to be supposed to be a charioteer, but he's light, he's, he's got a limp. So obviously one leg is longer than the other. And these stars here are known as the kids. Not sure exactly, he's supposed to be holding a goat, a, a kid, so a goat. I really sometimes, sometimes these constellations, they're, they're a little bit, um, you wonder, you wonder if they really did, really did smoke marijuana when they were doing this, because some of them are a little bit weird. But he's supposed to be controlling the, the chariot at the same time. It all seems a bit odd. However, this is the very bright star Capella, which marks the the um, the overhead point um, in the sky at uh, this time of the year. And as I say, these are the kids. Now, in that area between between the um, constellation of, of Aurega and the horns of Taurus, there are three clusters here. They're messier objects. They're really easy to find. And I mean that because I, I regularly look at them with binoculars because they're really they're they're easy to easy to search out. And they are M30, M36, M37, and M38. Now, when you look at them, you'll actually find that they're they're different. They even appear different in binoculars. M60, M50, M, sorry, M36 is a few splashy stars, uh, very bright, but once you've seen it, you know, it's a, it, there's not a lot more to see. M38, a little bit further along, is a different kind of cluster. It's actually got stars in the shape of a cross, and there's a lot of fainter stars in it. So it's really, really quite good to, to look at with a, a telescope. It, the telescope makes a huge difference, and you can see all the fainter ones. And also, there's a faint little blob with NGC. Um, let's think, NGC 1907, which is located close to it. And then there's M37, which is actually a little bit off on its own, but they're all in this area. You can more or less get them in the same field of binoculars. And that's a, that's a misty grouping of stars, very faint stars. And is the, as strange enough, is easy to see in binoculars, but telescope, it's a bit more problematic because of the greater power. But you you can still you can still find it obviously, and it's something if you sweep around it a bit, you'll come across it because the three of them, as I say, are arranged very close together. So you can compare those, and also with another cluster which is located here, and that's M thirty five. Now the great thing about this is that if you collect Messier numbers, you've already got when you've seen these four, you've got four consecutive numbers here: thirty five, thirty six, thirty seven, and thirty eight. So there we are down here, M35. Now M35 is a, a very, very splashy cluster. Lots of faint and bright stars. They seem to be arranged in circles. Well, sorry, in spirals. And uh, William Lassell, you viewing it with um, a 24 inch telescope, admittedly was one of them with a specular mirror and um, rather awkward to use. He actually made the comment that um, this was obviously the 19th century. He made a comment that nobody could see it without a shout of wonder um, because it was an amazing sight. Well, most things are in a 24 inch telescope, I've got to say, but even so, that's a good point. And um, it is quite spectacular. It also includes a red star in the field. And I'll come on to that in a minute. Well, we need to come down here, we get to this star Sirius, which we all know is the, the brightest star in the nighttime sky. Always remember if you go in a quiz and they ask you what's the brightest star in the sky, it's the sun. But if they say nighttime sky, it's Sirius. It can catch you out that one. 
Um, Sirius is bright mainly because it's very close. It's about eight light, just over eight light years distant. It's an A-type star. But located immediately below it is a rather nice open cluster, and that's M41. M41 is quite um, a bright cluster. It's because it's bright because I can actually see it or have seen it last winter um, through my three and a half inch refractor, um, even in, in Watford. So it can be seen. And that also has a red star in the center. And this is, this is a, a point here because it's one of the things that astronomers use to gauge the age of clusters. They assume that clusters, that, that, that open clusters form from the, the, something like the Orion Nebula. And the, the bright stars, the really young star, the really hot stars, they over time, um, very quickly, or much quicker than other stars, they become red giants. So typically when you see a cluster that has a lot of B type stars, the O type stars, the really hot ones, have actually by that time have, 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 have um, become red giants. So that's a way of, of dating. And they actually make up a cluster, um, Hartsbrun Russell diagram. And by the shape of that, with the, the way which stars have evolved and which haven't, they can work out the age of the cluster. So that's that's a good little um, piece of information about stellar um, astronomy. And uh, it's an important point. Another thing, of course, which, is, which causes problems with distance is dimming by dust. And that is another phenomenon that was discovered by a fellow called Trumpler, who worked in America. And um, it, it does alter dating of the, the dating of stars because it alters the, the uh, color of the light. There's all sorts of complications here. But just remember, next time you see a red star, that's in a cluster, and a lot of them have. So I'm just gonna move this around a little bit more. And we come to, we come to, I hope, yeah, we come to Perseus. Perseus somewhere here, there he is. Yes, there he is. Perseus. Another cluster there. Uh, this is Perseus. This is the um, Perseus OB um, uh, association. Lots of bright white stars. And there's the, uh, the, the famous cluster here. And down here, where it, where it goes into Andromeda, you've got um, a cluster here called M34. Now, that's another one. Sorry, is it M34? Yes, M34. So M34 is there, that's very easy, very easy to see in binoculars. So what you can do is you can take a trail round going up and down and then through into, into um, uh, Gemini for, the, for uh, M35 and then down towards Sirius over here and look at M41. And just in case, just in case you're thinking, well, it's all right for him, he knows where everything is. I make mistakes too. Um, when I, when I, the last two evenings that I had clear, I was a bit out of practice and I was looking for, as I said, said to you, I was looking at the, this area here with um, where, where Monoceros is and I couldn't find um, Beta Monoceros, which I, is also known as, as eight, believe it or not, some, cat, some uh, catalogues. And I couldn't find it. And I kept looking and looking and looking. I couldn't find it. And then I realized that I was looking in the wrong place. I was looking up here somewhere. So I was lucky two nights later, later I actually had a chance to, uh, to, to see it. So we all make mistakes. It's, but it, so I'm telling you that if I can do it, anyone can do it. It's just a straightforward sort of thing. You, if you use binoculars, you can actually see them as you go around. So that's a little binocular project if you'd like to see what, what, uh, what you think. And um, really, there's not a lot more that I can say, other than the fact that when we come to the to the to the um, we're coming towards the um, the spring now. So Leo is prominent at the moment. In fact, I've seen it in the night sky um, the, again the last time I looked, which was last Sunday. And also, you know, I sometimes talk about um, Regulus and uh, and the fact that you've got um, Arleonis here, the the, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, long period variable star. Well, that is currently very bright. It's, it's somewhere around the 
fifth, sixth magnitude at the moment. So it's pretty easy to see, and it's really easy because you just take a line from Regulus, go slightly up, and you will actually come across it, and you can actually see it at the moment. That you can see in binoculars or a small telescope. And um, it, it forms a nice triangle in a telescope with two stars that are companion stars. They're quite a lot fainter. They're about the ninth magnitude, but um, it makes a nice little sight. So it's the orange glow and the other two stars in this little tight little triangle. Maybe it's me. It just, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm easily pleased. Could be. <laughs> OK, so um, I'm going to close up now so that we can go back to the main part of the meeting. Uh, thanks very much for that, Richard. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff there. And as always, the southern sky seems to be the most interesting area, doesn't it? It is. And uh, I should say, a pair of binoculars makes a heck of a difference as to what you can see. Mm. And particularly when the weather's like it is now, you have only got maybe a half an hour maximum to get out and look at something before something happens. Mm, too right. So, yeah, thanks very much for that. G a great tour of that uh, part of the sky. Thank you. So at that point in time, I think we're probably finished uh, the main meeting. So I'm quite happy to let the uh, Zoom run on for another while, uh, for about 15 minutes or so. So that if you want to chat among yourselves, you can do. And uh, just uh, I'd like to say thanks again to all our contributors and thank you all for attending tonight. And we'll see you next time in February. <laughs>